Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host Bryn Edwards. Games, play and different ways to explore and learn are some of the topics we're going to dive into with my guest today, Dr. Kate Raines Goldie. Originally from Toronto in Canada, Kate moved to WA in 2007. An award-winning game engineer, educator and keynote speaker, Kate has been continually recognised across Australia and internationally for her role and thought leadership in the development of the gaming industry across education, business and government. She has a ton of academic achievements and her PhD thesis is one of the most downloaded from the Curtin website. I checked out Kate's LinkedIn site to get a feel for her background and she has numerous roles with companies, bodies and organisations all focused in the area of gaming. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I've never been described as a game engineer before. I kind of like that. Really? Yeah. I got that from you. Did, really? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, well, I got it from <laughs> I, your, I guess I must I have forgotten. It you, I must have forgotten that I said There you it. go. I think yeah, I got it from your LinkedIn okay. account, which, as I said, you know, on there we've got keynote speaker, founder of the Human Academy. Future Human Academy. Yes, um, <laughs> which does school programs, innovation and emerging tech advisor. You write for the business news and technology, kind of SciTech, STEM. It goes on. How do you do all this stuff? Oh, it's called portfolio career. Portfolio. Yes. How do you balance it all? Well, the trick that I found is I try to have the same, for, the, for a week that I'm working, I try to have the same thing that I'm doing. Right. So sort of if I'm doing a talk um, about a certain topic, then I'll try and make the, that the article that I'm writing that week about that yes. or if I'm teaching that week about something I'll talk about what so it's just it's, that for a week not always or at yeah. least I try to at least have some kind of similarity and make make sure that everything I'm doing kind of feeds into it so if I'm doing some writing for particle or for business news then often that can feed into a talk that I'm doing so it's kind of doing the research ah, so there's a way to kind of have a strategy around right. not just kind of because at the beginning when I was doing it that was what happened I just felt I was not doing trying to do too many things, but you can actually say, have a strategy chaotic. about it. Yeah. Yeah, and also, you know, um, moving from topic to topic to topic to topic would mean that you do a lot, but not get a lot done as well at the same time. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. So you stay around <laughs> one topic area and feed lots of things off that. Yeah, exactly. And right. so um, I just finished a, uh, a speaking tour around Australia for the Australian Computer Society, and a lot of what I talked about there had been things that I'd actually written about during the year. So I was actually able to use um, interviews and case studies and things from that work that I had done. So it all kind of, you can be strategic about yes. how you use the work that you're doing and not yeah. just be, that's something I've had to learn is not do something new every time. Cause that's what I, I love doing is pushing the boundaries and seeing what new things you can do, but it gets a bit tiring. Yeah. So I'm getting better at being a bit more strategic about that. Super. Yeah. So one of the questions I always ask guests at the start is particularly you like me. Weren't grown, uh, weren't born here and grown yeah. up here. Why WA? How did you get here? That's yeah, that's a funny story. Um, so my parents are Kiwis, so I have a Kiwi passport, All so right. I can come and I, I can come and be here, and they can't kick me out until they change their mind. I don't know; they might change their mind again. They keep changing yep. the rules about us being here. Um, but I, when I was twenty. 22 so I was an undergrad and third year undergrad in mm -hmm. Toronto um I had this crazy idea that I was going to write a a, a paper and present it at an academic conference because I didn't know that you didn't do that as an undergrad so I started doing that and I decided that I wanted to well I wanted to find a conference to speak at so I googled conferences that were internet studies conferences and there was one coming up in Toronto but the deadline had passed so I was in Toronto at the time, and of course, I just decided to email the conference organizer and say, can I have an extension? And um, that was my, ended up being my PhD supervisor. I think he was kind of taken by my chutzpah that, you know, this undergrad chutzpah. would not only like <laughs> decide to write a, a conference paper, um, but ask him for an extension. So he's like, you should come and do a PhD in Australia. And it took me a few years because it is literally so, the other side of the world to come here. So you, wait a minute, the conference was in Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. So how did it link? So he, so he was the organizer of the conference. Yes. Um, but he was the, used to be the head of the Internet Studies program in, yeah. in Australia and in, um, here in Perth and at Curtin. Um, and so he was, yeah, organizing the conference and said, you know, was taken by my work and, and said, you should come to come do a PhD with me in Australia. So, so why I'd, not? Yeah. Well, it took me a few years to decide that I wanted to do that because it's a big, it's a big thing when you're 21 or something, 22, yeah. and it's, it was really far away, and I'd never been to Australia, but. Um, How, what did you know of Australia at that point? <laughs> so, 
Like, well, having Kiwi parents, you I don't maybe necessarily have the best view. Of, <laughs> of course, right? yes. And I, the, the, the interaction I remember was that when I was five, um, we were going to visit um, my relatives in New Zealand. And back then, the planes couldn't fly all the way. You had to stop to refill. Mm-hmm. Like, you, it had a lot of stops. And so I think we stopped in Fiji. And I just remembered these two Australians um, were like, hey, little American girl, do you want some chocolate on toast? And of course, it was Vegemite. Yes. And they were very disappointed that I was like, oh, it's Vegemite. It's pretty good, right? But yeah. it just had... <laughs> I really, it was so they were having a go. <laughs> yes, it was this, like, distrust of Australians from a very young age. But no, um, no, I love I love living in Australia. Yeah, I love. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. You know, you, no, no, no desire to go back to Toronto? Um, I like to visit. I like to visiting. I was there recently, but I... Yeah. I really love Fremantle. Like, there's no other place I'd want to live. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm becoming Australian <laughs> Superb. pretty soon. So, yeah. Superb. Yeah. So, um, in your story, there's obviously, a, there's a strong theme of games and play. Yeah. Where does that come from in your story and your background? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've always really been interested in games. So, I used, I've played video games for as long as I can remember. My parents very much didn't like that. <laughs> Me playing games mm. thought it was going to rot my mind, my imagination, rot my brain and ruin my imagination. Um, but yeah, played games for a very long time. I made my first video game when I was probably like 14 or something. Um, but it was, I went to an all-girls school that didn't really encourage that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was like the 90s. It wasn't that long ago. But um, I was, no one ever said that that could be a job or a career or anything mm. that I could do. So I kind of just did other things. I like ended up studying philosophy because you couldn't really study the internet or games. Um, so that was why I came here. It's the only place that you could do a PhD in internet studies. Now it's more mm. of a thing, but yes. at the time. So um, it's always just been something that I, I love. I just love being playful and exploring. And what actually got me into doing it professionally was I had a friend who was um, – he went to Microsoft Research as an intern, and when you're an intern, you play this game called, I can't remember what it's called, but it's an alternate reality game. I think it's called the intern game, mm. and it's basically you, you're let loose around the streets of Seattle, and there's all these puzzles and things, and you do it over a weekend, and it's like a live action game. Yes. So he did that, and he loved it, and he brought it back to Toronto, and I helped him to, to run one in Toronto, and I just got hooked on this that you could do this and and kind of be the puppet master and be mischievous and create funny, playful, joyful situations for people. So I just started making games with him and um, it was kind of a hobby. It wasn't really a professional thing, but then I had the Privacy Commissioner of Canada um, get me to create a um, a project to create a privacy literacy game with kids. And so that was when I realized that actually people would pay me to do this. And so that was kind of how it went from being this just passion to a... What's a so private privacy literary game look, look and feel like? It well, it was a so it was created with kids for other kids, and it was a board game with a connect an iPad so it was sort of an augmented board game. So the things that would happen on the board, you put in a code to the iPad, and you'd get cutscenes and different stories. And it was really interesting because the um, part of it was that we this is kind of the height of the moral panic around kids using the internet. Um, and what was really interesting about it is that kids already knew more than adults thought that they did. And they were mm-hmm. really more interested in not like, don't tell me don't to use the, to not use the internet. They wanted to know more about like, how do I make good judgments or risk assessments? Like, how can I determine who's a good person, not a good person? Or how can I determine what's a good thing to look at and not a good mm. thing to look at? So they want, they, it was actually more sophisticated than yes. adults. Um, so that was the game that they wanted to make was like, how do you make these judgments right. rather than just like, don't go on the internet. So that was quite interesting. Mm. Mm. And I guess when, when we're talking about gaming here, are we talking purely games on the internet? Like, or is your interest in games beyond the internet in the real world? Or? Yeah, no, it's definitely real world. So I mm. have not actually really made what would be classified as a traditional video game. So I've made, um, I just finished an, a, my second escape room game. You heard of escape rooms? Tell us yeah, okay. more so, about an escape room. The, it basically, it's a physical world thing where you get locked in a room and you have to solve a series of puzzles to get out. Yeah. And it's, there's there's escape room video games where you have to basically solve puzzles like the, in, in mm. virtual space. So it's like that. 
and um yeah i'm really interested in that kind of that experience not so much the mm. screen-based i'm really interested in that mixed reality pushing the boundaries of um what what is it that interests you there what what is it the what's the impact you're trying to have with this yeah so the, well, this project was interesting because it was another and this is i think something that i do that's different um than most other game designers is that i do very much the co-creation so the same with the privacy commissioners game which mm. was with kids for kids this was also same thing so it was three days working with a group of um, teenagers um 15 teenagers teenagers over three days we created um, a game and then the second three days we actually ran the game and presented it to the public for everybody to play right. so they created all of the puzzles and the stories and we kind of just created a scaffold you, what's the process like for creating a game um, yeah, it's different every time. And that was, that was interesting because I had never done that exact, and this is me doing that thing where I do everything new every time, which is good, but it was really, it kind of freaked me out, but somehow it always works out. But that process there, the challenge was how do you, um, you have three days to make a game and it has to be ready within mm. three days to present to the public. So there's no room for, mm. for failure really. Yes. And there's no time in between, which is a rather ambitious project. And it worked out. It was really, really good. But the, the not only were we creating the game, we were creating the process of making the game. And so um, I worked with a creative coder also here named Steve Barrick, who's a um, really amazing guy who does a lot of work with uh, PVI Collective. Um, same kind of like physical world, tactical media art games. And um, we created a scaffold. So basically like a, an overarching story and um, I went to Bunnings and bought a whole bunch of different like puzzle locky boxes and different things that they could use to kind of inspire them. Mm. And then what we did was the the trick that I figured out was, and this is from a previous game that I'd done, was um, so it was set in a library and we made a story around um, librarians. And there was an AI that was basically trying to get rid of the librarians because it wanted to digitize everything. Yes. So we had a room and we had um, four lockers. And so we broke the, the, it down into four four groups of mm -hmm. kids. And they each had a locker and they each had a librarian that they were in charge of. So they made the story around the librarian. They made the puzzles that fit in there. And then we basically made sure that they were stitched together. Because the way escape rooms work is there's a puzzle track. Right? Yes. So you start one puzzle and you go to the... Next it un one. unlocks it, the next one goes to the next one. So you have to make everything work together. Mm -hmm. So this worked because it meant that we were able to break it down into smaller chunks. The kids had a thing that they were responsible for, and it was easy to manage that way. So, yeah, yeah that works really well. They The puzzles they came up with were, like, we didn't have to make very many changes to them, just, like, small tweaks. They, it was great. And, um, yeah, we were sold out for both the workshop and the, the game itself, and it was, yeah, Really good feedback from people. It was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So what is the, in the work and the things that you do, what is it that you're trying to push? What is it that the impact you're, you're trying to have mm. with your work? So I'm taking a, an online course right now and um, sort of business development course. And the one of the questions is you have to figure out. Is this for yourself? Yes. Yes. Right. To help me to have more <laughs> clarity about all the things that I do. Yeah. But one of the things is you have to figure out what your word is. Mm. So I think my word is empowerment. Right. And so what the theme that runs through all my work is is empowering people to thrive in the future and understand the future and feel comfortable with it. So with the game design stuff, it's helping kids because um, game design, it has a lot of transferable skills that can be used for other things, especially around like play testing and um, working with your users or your players um, and critical thinking and teamwork and all of these other kind of like really useful, important future skills. Um, so I'd say that's kind of the thing is I'm trying to empower people for the present and the future. Yes. I, guess, yeah. I was going to say, cause you mentioned the future. So yeah. time. what do you see in the future? What do you, or rather what are the requirements you see in the future? that you're helping people yes. develop so they can thrive. Yes. So, yeah, that's why we do a lot of work with young people um, is because, so I, I think like I was an early adopter of the future of work and that what I do now didn't exist when I was going through high school. Mm. And so no one could advise me about what I should be doing, right? Yes. So no one's going to so, tell me that what I do now, that, like, that didn't, even the way of working that idea of a portfolio career yeah, I was wasn't going to really say, a thing. Working with games in a portfolio career. Yeah. So it didn't exist. 
And that caused me a huge amount of existential angst. Like it just made me sad and because you know like if you, you don't have a purpose mm. and you don't know how did to you know it was out there at the time no i just, just didn't know i just was there? just because you when you're a teenager you just you know it's you don't have enough to have context to know that that it will be okay right yeah <laughs> probably so no one's um, telling you that it's yeah exactly because no one really knows like someone was like you'll be bill gates and i was like i don't want to make dos i don't want to make <laughs> like operating systems i want to work with people and do cool stuff um so from the, so and and all of the skills that have served me well have not been so I think we're really focused on getting kids to code right now is like preparing them for the future, and it's like I have a philosophy degree and that's actually served me really really well. So it's the the In soft what way? it's the soft skills that are that Such are not as... like critical thinking, yeah. um, writing, um, right. um, basically like a- a- analyzing and making an argument. Mm. Um, so the, those come from philosophy, um, but also things like communicating well, um, entrepreneurialism, um, creativity, like all of these things that are kind of human skills, you can't, those, they're actually very hard to automate. We can't automate them. It's all of the kind of like more computer or machine skills like coding that actually have a very high chance of being automated. Yes. And so by teaching, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach kids to code, but just by thinking that that's the solution and... I feel like we're we're moving too much into the like let's do all this technical stuff rather than like let's actually make humans be amazing humans rather than not so mm. great machines because otherwise we will be left with tons of humans that just can't talk to one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And so that was one of the the, bit, the bits of feedback too for that workshop that um the, the kids escape room workshop was that um we're actually getting kids to work with each other because it was we weren't in front of computers the whole time there was mm. very little actual technical stuff. Um, there was a bit of that with Steve who does creative coding um, where the kids could come and see the back end and, and fiddle from that perspective. Mm. But it was, they spent so much time in front of screens and that was the kind of the point of that project was to get them to, and that's why I really like working in the physical world is that you can actually spend more time working with other people mm. and making physical puzzles and doing all this really cool Just stuff. Tangible and, and yeah. And talking and, to each other and, and yeah. And teamwork. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so all of these things that they probably aren't learning um, that are really, really important. And so, yeah, that's, that's where I think, and, and using games as a way to get kids interested. Cause if you look at games, there, there's a push towards STEM and steam, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Yeah. And that, that, that's games, right? So in last week that, or the week before last, um, that's what we're doing in, in that, in that program, right? Is mm. it's using games as a way to bring them in. Cause all kids love making games and um, playing games and so it's this really great hook to get them to come in and learn all this stuff mm. and um, yeah teach them future skills how do you take these lessons and work with businesses how, so hmm how do I take them for working with I know you yeah you yeah know, just you, shifting you write, gears entirely yeah because yeah. I know you write for business yeah, news yeah. and yeah so it's um I would say it's, yeah, it's very interesting because when I do workshops around games and playfulness yeah. for adults, it's actually very different than for kids. Like kids, there's a lot less stuff that I have to yeah. kind of get them to it's probably, shift in their brain. Is it fair to say that the playfulness is more natural? Yeah. Yeah. So they're more because interested. Because they're in a playful state. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's childhood. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's a lot easier to get them. But I don't have to preface this all stuff as much or say... Mm they're already kind of more open-minded about mm. things. So with, with adults, when I'm working with them, it's more, um, think broadly about what a game can be. It's not just a video game. So kids yeah. seem to get that naturally. Like they're just like, yeah. Hence why I asked you that question yeah. earlier on, just to clarify, you know, yeah. we we're just talking about video games yeah. or virtual reality or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, they, yeah, I find you have to kind of preface things a bit more. Um, but in terms of the, the usefulness of like being playful, I think um, it's very, very useful for adults because it helps to um, be more playful and think outside the box and take risks. So I, I ran a, a workshop around mixed reality for Deakin University. Mixed um, reality meaning? So there's the Microsoft sense of the word, which is just kind of augmented reality, but I mean mixed reality and they're like the truest sense of the word, which is actually mixing the physical and the digital. So not just right. overlaying. Yes. Uh, just a digital image onto the real world, but actually 
um, you know, attaching sensors to things and having this, like maybe there's like a sensor in here that's sending it to the, mm. to the phone. You can see how much tea is left and the, how yeah, warm I was gonna it say, is. This being the mug with yeah. the tea. Oh yeah. Sorry. For the listeners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so yeah, so mixed reality in that the truest sense of the yeah. word. Um, and what I loved about that workshop is it was with some very senior academics, so like the head of school Yeah. and a part of it, cause I do very hands-on um, workshops was that they had to, we were playing a game. So what we do is we play games and then we deconstruct the games mm. and then think about what we can change about the game next time we play it yes. um, and, and see what's different about it. And that's basically how you learn game design. So we played this game out in the kind of courtyard in the middle where all the students were and um, they had to be a helicopter. So they had to link arms and spin around from one side of the, the courtyard to the other. So it's like the senior academics, right? And they, it was, there was no... No, well, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. They're totally into it. And it's yeah. just because like games, it's like it gives you permission to be ridiculous and to just yeah. be innovative and to be playful. And um, yeah, and so I've been talking with um, uh, talking with one of my clients about doing an, an escape room for corporate, uh, like a, an, ex an executive escape room. Hmm. So um, yeah, how I mean. Do you, I how do you sell an escape route? <laughs> how do I how sell? Do you scale, sell an escape route, room? To a corporate environment, what? Well, that that's to be discovered because um, it was actually start? their idea. Yeah. Well, so what I would think that it would be is that um, what are the outcomes that that deliver. I think that you'd build in some a problem that there. It depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a colleague who does a lot of work with virtual reality and um, using it for corporate training around leadership. So if you're going to use a leadership example, you'd probably want to build in some kind of leadership exercise into solving the problem with i mean it's kind of naturally mm. it's team building i would say already because you have to work as a team to get out of the room so i think it would just be probably adding in some kind of debrief after that to kind of be more reflexive about the learning because you don't want to be too heavy-handed about making the experience seem because the point of or the power of games is that you're doing it without realizing you're doing it I th and i th that right. to me is 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 the key of playfulness. Yeah, is that you're doing stuff without realizing you're doing it. Yeah, we spend so much time. I, I was asking you then, what, why am I doing it? What's the benefit? Yeah. What's you know, that's the management consultant in me coming out of it. Yeah. How do I sell it? What's the outcome? Yeah, yeah. etc. Um, yet, you know, I, I, I used to study something to do with motivational styles about how one day you can wake up and be you know super focused, and then and, and then you wake up on Saturday and you're all like all over the shop because yeah. we, we we vary from one end of the scale to other one is very purposeful one is very playful the yeah. two can't live together yeah well and they can though <laughs> you can have purposeful playfulness but when you're playing you're not necessarily yeah. purposeful yeah. in that moment yes exactly so yeah so sorry you were saying yeah, yeah. so it's adding in that i think that reflexiveness to it yeah. so it wouldn't be while you're doing it, it would just be having like a debrief after and then talking about what the kind of learnings and the experiences mm. were and then just kind of bringing that to consciousness, I think would be the, the way to do it. Mm. Um, but I think, I mean, I've done, I did a, a workshop, a day long workshop with the RAC to help them understand um, uh, basically road safety and young people, like what they're interested in. And the feedback I had from that was that it was um, really deep, heavy learning, but it didn't feel like that at all so they're they, they, these kids were learning this you know really serious like transferable skills around um design thinking and prototyping and iteration but they it didn't feel like it was school at all they were all just like super engaged for the whole time so i think it's that hmm. thing where you can do all these like really serious things but the playfulness kind of makes it light and fun hmm. so yeah hmm. Hmm. and I understand you do work with government as well. Yes. So why are they interested in guys? Oh, same, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So it's largely, um, it's not always the two, the kind of areas that I consult in are um, games. So, so how it's kind of a recognition around kind of anybody under 35 games are really important cultural kind of touchstone. So I'm speaking at the um, digital directions conference, which is the national, the um, annual conference for the, um, um, Australian Film and Television Archive. Um, and the, what they're interested in is basically being having this explained to them, like an explainer of why games matter. So why they're mm. an important cultural economic force. Because game, the games industry is bigger than film and TV combined. Sorry, mm. film and music combined. This um, being, well, going back to the 
uh, digital video style game. Yes. Yeah. So that's just entertainment video games. Yes. Yeah. That's like a hundred and I think it's one hundred and forty billion U.S. dollars this year. Mm. So massive, massive um, industry. But we still, for some reason, don't really get it as like an important cultural force. So they're they're recognizing that we need to start preserving this as like Australian culture and art, but also using it as an engagement tool because mm -hmm. there's a recognition that young people like that's a kind of a natural way to engage. There's that. Um, and then the other thing is kind of like future, what's happening in the future. And so, yes. um, you know, what, what are important future technologies to pay attention to, trends? So those are the kind of two yeah. areas that I do a lot of work with the government mm. on. Um, also kind of advising. I was on the STEM advisory panel, so advising how to engage around STEM for young people as well. But there's an interesting link between those two, which is that I think games are kind of like the jobs of the future because a lot of, mm. like I was talking about earlier, a lot of the skills required to make games are hard to automate. Yes. So, and it's a growth sector. So the games industry mm. grew, I think, by 13% last year, which is more than expected. Mm. Given so, that it's based on a human experience, it's yeah. difficult to automate yeah. the creation of a human experience. Yeah, exactly. And it's also connected and driving um, a lot of the kind of really innovative new technologies like mixed reality and virtual reality and augmented reality um, and AI as well. So all of that's kind of connected in with what's happening. So I think that's kind of the connection between those two two areas of that I work in. Mm. I noticed that, um, I, I like this when I was reviewing, as I said earlier on, when I was reviewing your LinkedIn profile, it, one of your superpowers <laughs> is, uh, what is it? Uh, predicting and demystifying trends that will become yeah. part of that. So w what's hot to trot in this world at the moment? Right now? Yeah, so people are still um, talking about virtual reality, but it's mixed reality that I think is, is really interesting. Um, and that's kind of what I was saying earlier about that. Um, really mixing of um the digital and the <clears throat> the physical but not just the overlaying of yeah um just images but um there's a group in melbourne called opaque space and mm -hmm. they're basically doing they started out doing a virtual reality space walking game and now they're working with nasa and boeing to create um the astronaut training for them right and they're moving really into that mixed reality space where ah. it's um they did one uh, recently for the at the Tokyo Game Show called um, Lunar Mission, and it was mixed reality in that truest sense where you had, um, so it was, it was multiplayer. Um, you could actually most of uh, VR experiences now you're stuck in a four by four or a chair, yes, and you can't walk around. So this is like free roam with other people. Um, objects that are in the physical space are actually you could see and interact with in right. in virtual reality. So the problem with virtual reality right now is you can see a chair, but if you sat on it, you would fall. Yes. But they actually put the objects into the game, so it solves that problem of like tactility. Right. So yeah, it's mixed reality in the truest sense. So it's sense. not quite like what's the film that came out? Yeah, you know, Ready Player One, yeah. where everyone's in these little uh, caravans yeah. <laughs> stacked on top of one another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're actually walking around in a, in a physical yeah. space. So again, if like that cup was in it, you would actually see the cup yeah. and be able to pick it up and touch it and do things with it. Right. So that's I think that's really, really interesting um, in terms of where things are headed. Um, and interestingly, I think a lot of people maybe think that VR is a bit over, a bit overdone, but there's a lot of work in the training space that's really, really interesting. So that was what was interesting about Opaque is that they started out making games and now they're doing astronaut training. Like, how cool is that, right? Yeah. And we have some great companies. Playful astronaut training. Yeah, because it's hard to, you can't practice going into space without going into space, except no. in VR. Yes. So, um, yeah, that, that use of VR for training or mixed reality for training, there's two companies here in WA that do a really good job of that, mm. which is Being VR, who do um, diversity and leadership training using VR, and um, <clears throat> Sentient Computing, who do um, basically uh, training for the resource sector. So they'll actually go and mm. map... Um, uh, the, the the work site and make it look exactly like it would be in real life. And then you can actually go and, and practice um, doing the dangerous things like working at heights or high vol voltage yeah. switching, things you can actually die. So you go and do it and you can practice more safely and it means by, by the time you actually go to the work site, you've actually done it. Yeah, you ground in... Yeah, you've, yeah, like, you've already hours, done this. You've got the neural yeah, pathways. You've, yeah, you've, exactly. You've, you're on it. And the cool thing that they were telling me that I think is really kind of pushing what we can do with VR is that um, we often think of VR as a solitary experience, and they're actually finding that um, using it in a group, yeah. so having the instructor, instead of coming up and, and standing with a PowerPoint and saying, here's how you do this, they actually have the VR headset, and they have a screen behind them showing 
what they're doing in VR and they can pop in and say, okay, this is how you do it. Yeah. You can actually show how to do the thing. Right. And you've never, that's something you couldn't do before show. VR. And can they then watch somebody else? Do yeah. It? So they can pass the headset to the other person, to the person yeah. they're training and they can come and try it. Right. But there's a big screen at the back where you can see kind of like the window into VR. Oh, in terms of what they're doing, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So that use of VR, I think, is pretty innovative that no one's, or I'm sure other people have, well, maybe, I don't know if they've come across it or not, but it's not like a known thing yeah. that people talk about. And so that was a really interesting insight from those guys around how we can, be yeah, training for, for VR, using VR. Yeah. What is the um, gaming scene in Western Australia like in terms of game <laughs> creation and game play? Yeah, that's a good question too. So we have uh, about 7% of the games industry. This is maybe a stat that's about two years old. So it could, mm. it could, I would suspect it's increased. Um, Victoria has 50% because they have, um, they've had historically a long period of um, the government supporting their games industry, yeah. which is something we don't do here. Although um, I spent about five years um so i used to i created and ran um the film and television institute's games interactive program yes they've unfortunately Just got funded. defunded and no longer exist yes um but for you know a bit before that and a bit after that um i spent a lot of my time advocating for getting games funding in, Austra in western australia yes. and so i'm really happy to see that they actually the government has just announced um, a pilot project to provide some funding largely around travel yeah. So getting um, our local developers to go to the big international conferences, which are it's really one of the we need more than that in terms of yeah funding, but, it's, but, it's a start but we've had to nothing. Stimulate. So yeah, so really happy that like yeah. me being a pain in the ass for like five years <laughs> finally got um, something to happen. Something to happen. Yeah. yeah. So that's really good. And it's an interesting concept. If you you know we've what does, what's WA famous for yeah. digging up stuff and yeah. selling it. Yeah. Monetizing molecules. Yeah. Um, how many tons of video games do you export <laughs> yes exactly and yeah I mean that is a hugely scalable product yeah 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 can just you yeah. know you know yeah. expand and that, that's been my argument when I was kind of like um, advising the government on um, you know why we should be doing this and how to structure the, fu the funding mm. is that um, we have an incredible talent base here we have um, ECU and um, Murdoch both have games programs curtains kind of has one sort of halfway developed. Um, but we, we're creating all these amazing grads. Mm. And um, in my time supporting the games industry at FTI, we lost two really kind of important um, games people, like game studios, that went to Melbourne. Right. And um, that's just the ones that I know of that I don't know about the um, the grads who have just the, those are established studios. This is I'm not I'm not aware of. We don't, we're not keeping track of yeah. how many grads are graduating from where Murdoch's are, program and leaving. Where are talents going? Yeah, but it's um, and I've had also um, I run a program called Play at Perth, and I've had mm. um, I keep getting amazing people volunteering for that. So it's a, basically a showcase of what's happening in creative innovation and games in WA. And I've lost two people, two amazing people that were volunteering for me to Melbourne. Right. <laughs> so I just lost my, my event manager um, two days ago. So, yeah, it's like a thing. We keep we have this amazing talent that we um, are... Most nurture and then lose. Yeah, it's a brain drain, right? It's not good. Yeah. And um, it's if you look at Black Lab Games, who are, I think probably Australia or WA's most successful game studio, um, they created um, Black Lab... Or, um, excuse me, um, Starhammer. Um, which was a battle, battleship, um, space battleship game, mm. um, space fighting, um, using spaceships. I'm not, I don't know why I'm not articulating this well, but um, <laughs> spaceship battle game. There you go. Yeah. Um, and that turned into them getting a, um, a uh, contract to do um, uh, Battlestar Galactica. Right. So that's like this major global franchise. So they made the newest Battlestar Galactica game. Right. Um, that's made here in, in WA. And the reason they were able to do that is the guy who runs it, Paul Turbitt, um, there used to be a federal fund for the games industry. And he got, I think it was $50,000, like one of the last ones before they, they shut it down. Yeah. And so he got that and he was able to quit his job and hire staff to make that initial Star Hammer game. Yeah. Um, and then from there, because they had that game, when he wanted to pitch, he basically made a version of 
well, the, the genre that they were looking for for yeah. the, the Battlestar Galactica game. So blueprint. So it yeah, so it was like, okay, you've already done this game. It's done really well on Steam. Um, now we want you. So it has the proof of that they're the proof of concept. They're able to um, able to, to do something really good. So um, he now employs a bunch of people. He works on that full time. And so that's like this case study of a small investment that's actually led to he's still here. He's, yeah. he's you know, he's he's creating jobs and bringing money into the state. Yeah. But that does. And he did it because he got the last kind of little bit of money before the federal fund closed down. Yeah, so tap closed. Yeah, exactly. And so you can see how it, it works, but hmm. we're not doing that. And so that it's just it's like it's a tiny amount of money, right? Like fifty thousand dollars for the government, it's tiny. Hmm. Um and I'm sure that, you know, the amount of money that's bringing into the state is they've already brought more than fifty thousand dollars from that. Indeed. Yeah. So um yeah, so there's there, there we have a really vibrant, interesting games industry. I think we punch above our weight, especially around VR. Mm. There's a lot of really interesting VR stuff happening. Um yeah, I really, I really hope that we um, do more to support it. And I do, from talking to um, the folks of the government, I think that they also are wanting to get more into not just video games, but that kind of serious games, gamification, mixed reality space. And that's really good because I think... I was um, going to ask. Yeah. What about you know, like the games, yeah, the more sort of away from the screen, yeah. everyday games that you can play that brings people out of themselves yeah. builds community but all that sort of stuff yeah and that so that's that's what i love doing that's like my thing but i'm mm. i think one of very few i think maybe so yeah i mean pvi collective are probably the only ones doing that in wa mm. and, and where are you just bringing your games here um well it's more i do more of the co-creation stuff so yeah. it's like not just straight up, I'm going to make a game, but it's... Let's bring it on the public. <laughs> yeah, it's... it's So the PVI Collective has done really well at that because they've come at it from an art perspective mm. and they haven't used the word game. Right. And so I've made the mistake of doing that and no mm. one will fund that because games are not art, apparently. <laughs> right. Whereas if you call it immersive theatre. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, no, they... Because they because they come from that art background. Yes. So they, they're able to, to do that and couch it in that and have done really well and done some amazing work. Mm. um yeah so i have that challenge right i'm not able to do that um and so what i've done is more of the um not just the the actual game it's the process and the final um piece that that is the i think the magic yes right so it's we're gonna get a bunch of for example, the escape room, we're going to get 15 teens to, we're going to teach them how to, we're, they're going to become game designers who are actually going to make a game. So they have this incredible, um, empowering experience. Um, as a, It was a, a school holiday program. And then we're actually going to make a game that en then engages the, the larger public. So you get even more people coming in and playing games. And so it's that kind of combination of um, the physical world game and the actual process of making it that seems to be the, the magic thing. Yes. Yeah. So if someone's listened to this and they're thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I don't get enough playfulness and, yeah. and, and, and games in my life, <laughs> yeah. uh, what can they do? What can they do? <laughs> well, I think everybody plays games. I think sometimes we yeah. think that we don't. Yeah. Um, I think it's a mindset as well, just around, uh, around being more. So I think maybe you could do little challenges of... So I do this thing where I, maybe this isn't being playful, but it's, um, I think, yeah, if you approach it from a playful perspective, it makes it less scary. So I have a challenge to myself. If I have something, an opportunity to do something that scares me every day, yes, then I'm going to do it. So it's like, if it scares me and I, I, I can do it and I'm not going to die, like it's like not, yeah. not like an actual yeah. life or death situation, then I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And I guess yeah. how I'm able to, it's like a, a playful mentality around, it's a game that I've made for myself. Yes. So, yeah, I think it's, there's a mindset there as well. Mm. Yeah, and it's like, well, because I've made this deal with myself that I have to do this, I have to do it. And so I've done yeah. things that I wouldn't normally do. Like, that well, have been give good. us a couple of examples. <laughs> um, oh, this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> the last one I can remember doing was um, I was having lunch in a cafe, and there's this rather interesting guy sitting next to me. And... Um, I wanted to give him my business card and um, I just like, I'm not good at talking to strangers. I'm actually quite a, an introvert, right? but I, I was like scared enough to not do it. 
um, that I decided I had to do it. So I did. So you did? Yeah. Just turn up, hey, here's my business card. Yeah. <laughs> you seem like an interesting guy. Do you want to go for coffee? Right. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Which I think other people might not find that as scary, but you know, it's like yeah. things like that where you're not going to die and it's an irrational fear. Yeah. 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 So as you've gone along your journey, yeah. Um, what are some of the most interesting things you've learned so far? Some of the most interesting things I've learned so far. Hmm. That's a really good question. Hmm. Well, I can talk about, I've been bouldering a lot recently. I don't know if this is in the most interesting thing, mm. but I've been quite fascinated by, um, yeah, the whole, so bouldering is basically rock climbing without ropes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's a, a, a gym, um, close to my house called Portside and it's basically an indoor, a room with walls that are covered in plastic holes that you can climb on. Yeah. And I've been quite fascinated with it because, um, it's like a puzzle for your body. So I'm not super into mm. exercise, right. <laughs> but, um, I really like bouldering. And so I've been thinking a lot about why do I like bouldering and why is it such a, um, a good experience for me? And it's again, coming back to playfulness. Mm. Um, and yeah, so it's the, the interestingness for me is, is reflecting on why, why it's, why so appealing and it's because it's almost so it's like a puzzle for your body and it's almost like a live action video game where it has the same elements around video games that make them so compelling and so i guess i'm reflecting on this is how you can kind of deconstruct those bits and then put them into other things yes so it's a puzzle for your body in that basically you have to so you have these they have, they're called route setters and they call them problems so the things you have to get from the bottom to the top are called problems and they every two weeks they change there's about five walls and every two weeks one of the walls gets changed so you have two weeks or a bit longer than that to actually it'd be, yeah it would be longer than two weeks so you have a set amount of time to, to solve these problems and each one's they're color-coded as well so there's different levels and you have to figure out how to get your body from the bottom to the top and it's this kind of thing about persistence and um you can ask people for help. Like, do you have any, that you say, do mm. you have any beta about this problem? Can you give me some hints? And it's this, it's like, like a video game. We keep doing it again and again and again. And then you'll have someone say, Oh, well, why don't you just put your foot like this or just try doing this move and you do it. And it's like, Whoa. Wow. Right. And it's just like this, you've been trying for like a week to get from, and you've gotten halfway up and you can't get past. It and they make the, they tell you this one little thing. And it's like this, physical feeling it unlocks yeah it's like wow and it's wow. like the same thing with um with video games where um you're doing it again and again and again and then to get, get, get past level one you're stuck on this thing and then you get to level two and it's it's that making failure fun and you're learning from it and um and also i think that why i don't like exercise is that my mind just goes I hate this. Can we stop? I hate this. Can we stop over and over again? Mm. But with this, is that with the more traditional running style repetitive? Yeah. Movement? Yeah. I hate that stuff. So I'll do yoga cause it turns off my mind, but that's a completely different yeah. way that it's doing that. Whereas this yeah. occupies your mind, right? Is you have to be, and if you're not completely hundred percent focused, you'll fall. So it requires that your, your mind is occupied. Present. Yeah. So focus. Yeah. Engaged. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cause you can hurt yourself. Um, and this is a nice bit of danger in there. Yeah, it sounds pretty fun. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, I, would, I wouldn't say that's maybe the most interesting thing that I've learned. I have to think about that. It's a really good question. But I'd say most recently, that's something that I've been reflecting on. It's like, why do I like this? And how can I use this in some of the other projects that mm. I'm working on to kind of... Um, and again, I suppose, listening to what you're saying, bouldering, um, I've become aware of it. Yeah. Um, listening to you again, it is a game. Yeah. It is playful. Yeah. You are doing deep learning. Yeah. But not heavy deep learning. Yeah. And then it's going somewhere else. So it's transferability of these skills. Yeah. And it's addictive. Like I usually don't think about exercise. I'm like not like, oh, I want to go for a run tomorrow. Yeah. But I think about that. I think about the problems like as I'm going to sleep, I'll like see mm. myself doing that one that I was trying to get at. Mm. And I'm like addicted to and I'll get upset if I go to the gym and they haven't 
Oh, they've changed the problem that I was working on and I didn't you finish it. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I didn't get to finish it. It's interesting because, um, so I've, over the last six months, have been going to movement classes. Yeah. Um, and Is that at MODIS? Yes. They, they, they do stuff at, um, mm. at Portside. And we have I love Mar- MODIS. And we have Mark on the show next week. Oh, cool. Um, and we had Margaret last year. Um, but there's a, there's a principle there about, um, from their mentor, Ido, who talks about zone one, two, and three. Zone one being exploration, two being perfection, three being maintenance. Oh, okay. And... And what we find is that um, you spend, we spend a lot, we're forced into a zone one. Yeah. And then just as you're breaking into zone two, whew, you're back to zone one again because yeah. they change the puzzle. Yeah. They change the puzzle. Yeah. And so what you're doing is you're continually engaged. You're continually making new neural pathways. You're continually challenging your body and trying to answer different uh, physical problems and physical um, challenges and riddles. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it just, you know, I, I'm also someone who's come from a, a traditional sort of enduro, uh, enduro sport background as well, where I, I'm, I'm quite good at going through the different things, the meditative mm. places, like swimming for hours or something like that. But this is very engaging. It is playful. And then I've found that all of a sudden I've noticed lots of different things going on in different areas of my life. And I was like, whoa, I do that all the time, the same way, the same way. How can I tinker? How can I play? Mm. And so, yeah, there's playfulness and playing. Mm. It, it, I think I think there's a lot in it to expand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the modus classes because they're playful. You play games, right? Yes. Yeah, and it's not again, it's not like that because they do a one, one a week at at uh, Portside, so it's like that mm. movement classes for, for yeah. people who boulder. And yeah, it's the same thing. I love those classes because you're just playing games. You don't feel like you're. Mm. Well, you do, you do feel like you're working hard. Yeah, but you it's do. Like, and at the end of it, fun. you feel exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Physically, mentally. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, what have you learned about yourself on your little journey with games and playfulness? What have I learned about myself? Well, you have some good questions. (laughs) What have I learned about myself? (laughs) Because I'm nosy. I'm curious. (laughs) Curiosity and playfulness sit together. (laughs) Mm. So, I think, well, maybe it's another thing is kind of what I've been working on with myself recently. Um, And I think this actually is something I think this is not just for me. I think it's something for everyone. I hope, mm. um, this idea of compassion and self-compassion. So I think I've been, I think a lot of people are hard. We're really hard on ourselves. Mm. And, um, I went to this Buddhist retreat in Japan, maybe about a year and a half ago. And it was, what was really fascinating about it was, the core of it was supposed to be a shiatsu workshop, but there was very little like actually touching. It was more, mm, very much about the elbows. intent. <laughs> yeah, there was there was hardly. I think it was like maybe we spent putting our thumbs on different parts, but it was all about not the thumb, but the intention, the intention that you have in your body when you're doing the thumb thing. Yes, or just being, um, like it was very much not. It was very much not shiatsu in the sense of the touching but the being and being all like how you are all the Mm. time but one of the core things was that um everybody is suffering and that is just a reminder that everybody is suffering and that is why often i think we're hard on ourselves and hard on other people is that suffering and just that Mm. reminder of um how to have compassion for other people is that reminder of that and the other piece of from what suffering it's life can be hard right life is can be a challenge and i think we all have stuff that we're working through and um i think that the so when when i was traveling around australia from my speaking tour um the three things that i said that we need to have for kind of having a, a good future is playfulness diversity and compassion and because i think that most things that happen that are bad in the world are because of um, suffering, right? So I'm not doing something to you because I'm trying to actually hurt you. It's because something's going on for me. Right? Yes. Most of the time. Yeah. So that compassion thing is, yeah. I think, really, really important. But it's also the other piece of that is that um, we forget to include ourselves in mm-hmm. that. And um, there's a book I've been reading called The Mastery of Self 
by um, Don Miguel Ruiz. Ruiz? Ruiz? Ruiz. 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 There we go. Um, and he says you can only love um, yourself. You, you can only love other people the way you love yourself. So it's kind of like if you want to, you know, when you're on an airplane, they say put your oxygen mask on first before you mm -hmm. help others. That's where I think that self-compassion yeah. comes from. And so I think we sometimes think that we're going to be compassionate to everybody but ourselves. And that's this unnatural distinction. You wear out. If yeah. You do that. Yeah. You're not putting stuff in your pot. How yeah. You put stuff in other people's yeah. pot. Yeah, but it's also just like, well, I'm not like this kind of maybe implicit thing about not being worthy or not being good enough. Like everybody else deserves compassion, but not me. Hmm. But it doesn't really work like that, right? And so I think that being giving yourself permission to take care of yourself, I think that's just like a, you know, I think we just, whatever for whatever reason in society we feel like hmm. it's not okay to be take to be engage in self care. And so I think that's something that I've been getting better at is both like compassion and self-compassion and those two go together have you been quite hard on yourself then in the past <laughs> i think so um i is that what's brought about <laughs> the success and the acknowledgement that... yeah i think i worked very hard um and i think i'm kind of trying to be more balanced in my life mm. and um yeah so i went to like a very academically focused high school and you know a lot of pressure from my parents and from that from that experience to just just always be working and so my sister went to that school as well and we both talked about how we would have this guilt about not being busy all the time and so just feeling like i should be doing something right now mm. and just getting past that like it's very good mm. for, for being really productive but it's not sustainable long term and so just kind of like undoing a lot of the or or just figuring out how to steer that into something positive rather than um burning out i've burnt out a few times i'm trying to avoid doing that again mm. i think it's fine it, for, for me it's finding a balance of i have to be hard on myself yeah because otherwise you can't be all you can be yeah or get to where you are but at the same time sitting back and making sure you are on the right path yeah and not just being busy for busy sake yeah and also sometimes you do need to rest yeah you can't do all the things until you you know you have to mm. You, know, you take care of your car, right? If you just run your car into the ground, you can't have the best car anymore. You Indeed. have to take care of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what do the next three to five years look like for Kate? So the big thing I'm working on is the other... So I had, I had a very busy um, maybe six weeks where I ran so two workshops, two, two week, uh, one-week workshops on either sides of the planet. So Toronto and Perth are on, literally on the opposite ends of the world. So... Mm. The week before um, the escape room workshop I did, I was in Toronto running another week-long workshop, um, funnily enough, with my old high school. <laughs> so it's kind of like um, mm. getting to do a lot of the stuff that I wish I'd had when I was in, going through high school, but it was a program to prepare young people for the future of work. So it was a um, for 11 and 12 students, um, and we it was largely a lot of work around, um, I think personal branding or personal marketing personal entrepreneurship is maybe the best way of thinking about it is um we often think about entrepreneurship in the con context of startups or the context of sm starting a small business but for even if you're going to have whatever you're going to do in the future mm. portfolio career a regular job a startup a business you need to be entrepreneurial yes and so it was teaching these skills around um, LinkedIn was a really big topic and I somehow got these teens to be now addicted to, to LinkedIn. One of them's like, I'm going to have 500, um, LinkedIn, um, connections by the end of the summer, end of Canadian summer. Um, so it was a lot of stuff around that and, um, talking about compassion for yourself and the value of failure <coughs> and, um, being okay with uncertainty. That was a really big thing. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of um, colleagues from Toronto who, same as me, kind of early adopters of the future of work, come in and talk to them. And then we went to um, an amazing game studio called Stitch Media. Um, and um, Evan Jones, the guy who runs it, he's run two Emmy, he's won two Emmys for his work with right. games. Amazing guy. Um, and he was so generous in that he let us come in um, and basically we did speed networking with every single person in his, his 15 staff members and the the girls in my program got to come and sit for five minutes with each person so what's amazing about game studios mm. is that the people working there it's a really diverse group of people in terms of background and um 
um, practice. And so there's people doing all sorts of different things. And so um, they were able to come and sit down and talk to them. And then they had all these offers for like, I'll connect you with this person. And um, we're just seeing, oh, like one of the, one of the girls said, um, you know, I, I'm, she's really interested, interested in social justice. And so she didn't think that there'd be anybody that she could talk to about anything related to what she wanted to do at the game studio. But she connected with this guy who wanted to increase diversity in the games industry and was like just having this amazing conversation. So she's like, I realized that um, I can now probably find a commonality with anybody and I'm feeling a lot more confident about talking to people, um, anybody. And so um, you could just see this after that. There's just this switch of... of me kind of talking to them about networking and the importance of networking and relationships and LinkedIn and them actually seeing people want to help me and people want to be my friend and people want to um, be engaged with it, especially because I'm a younger person who, you know, people want to be mentors and, and help younger people. So you could just see that they actually, from me telling them to actually them experiencing this, it was this huge yeah. transformative moment. And, the, and the, the folks at the game studio just like loved it because they got to show off their work and, you know, kind of pay it backwards for all the people who've helped them. So it was just this really, really great um, week. And um, that that's my focus for the next three to five years is building that up. So I'm bringing it back to Perth. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's I want to be doing that with um, figuring out a way because it was... Um, the, the school was has become a lot more privileged since I was there, um, and it was really great to work with like these really like extraordinary um, young women. But I want to be able to offer it to schools that really like people that really need it, like from low SES backgrounds. Right? Yeah. So my goal is to figure out a way to kind of um, maybe get sponsorship or um, subsidized by working with like the private schools to then be able to fund the more low SES schools because they're the ones who really need it. So that's that's my goal. Superb. Yeah. Superb. So that's the Future Human Academy stuff. That's Future Human Academy. Yeah. yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing how that yeah. maps out. So if you could go back and um, give Kate a piece of advice before she gets into doing a, a degree and starting her yeah. academic career and this, that, and the other, what would it be? Yeah, it would be that, that whole, it's okay to it's okay to fail. It's okay to not know what's going to happen in the future and to mm. be okay with an uncertainty. Mm. Cause that was something that, yeah, I, I, if I had known that, I think that it, it wouldn't, I would, I would have to, I mean, people can tell you that, but it's, you got to feel it. Yeah. So if somehow I could go back and make myself feel that, and no, and know that. <laughs> yeah. Know not that just, really. Yeah. Not really just know it. Like mentally yeah. engage with like it. Like see it somehow. Feel yeah. it and be it. Yeah. So if there's a way that I could have gone and back, gone back and done that, I think that would have made that would, definitely would have made a huge difference for me because it was that lack of like, yeah. And I think that's something that we all need to be because the future is so uncertain for everybody now, right? Like I think that's hmm. if we can just be more hmm. comfortable with risk. Which can and... either, yeah, which can either <laughs> be a source of huge anxiety, yeah, or huge potential. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Hmm. And do you have any other words of wisdom to the for the listeners out there? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I think comp that, that thing around compassion and playfulness, if you can be compassionate for yourself and, um, be compassionate for others and remember that we're all, we're all suffering. Hmm. Um, but then also being playful about it to try and make that. So I think that, yeah, I was just talking to a few friends about the importance of humor and I guess that's playfulness as well. It's like, I was talking about how I don't understand how people can go through life not having a sense of humor in terms of just like a coping strategy. Right? Yes. It's like if you can just make a joke of things, yes, you can talk. It's a way of, um, like even in relationships, right? If you can express something that's bothering you in a playful way, it's like makes that okay. It's like mm. it can be a joke and you can talk about it, but it takes that edge off, right? It takes the yeah. the sting of the thing. You can just have a laugh about it, and you've got your message across. Like, oh, I don't like, you know, we, you're always doing this crazy. You, the, you can, the way you can make it funny at the thing that's driving you crazy. Yeah, and then the person can hear it, but it's it's held in this playfulness that it's, um, yeah, it's okay. So yeah. I, having a sense of humor, <laughs> being I mean, I was, playful. <laughs> I, was, I was raised in England, so one of the things I, I learned to do quite quickly is laugh at myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
which is quite a gift. Yeah, yeah. And just being able... I mean, the, life is hard sometimes and the world is crazy. And yeah. um, if you can laugh and, and make it a bit more lighthearted, yeah. it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take it seriously. You shouldn't yeah. try and do something, See but it the makes humor it... humor in the universe. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it lighter and easier. Like that, using games to... Um, to learn right it makes it lighter and easier you can still do the work but it makes it more sweet hmm. yeah. so if somebody's listened to this and they want to get in touch with you how yeah. do they find you um so i have my website is kate so no hyphen just my my name and then future human academy is just future and you can send me an email i'm also on twitter um at ocean park Ocean yes that's my people have, i've had that a handle for so long this is before yeah. you used your real name on the internet yes but it's um from my favorite painting by richard d Wincorn. awesome yeah kate it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today uh it's been super playful <laughs> excellent <laughs> and it's been super fun and i've done a lot of giggling and uh i found it very engaging and i've learned a huge amount from it so thank you very thank much thank you so much for having me pleasure <laughs>